If you think you know Jordan Peterson, think again, because what you're about to watch is the most incisive set of clips from his conversation with John Stossel that cuts through the cultural noise of our time to reveal the true kernel of his message. And I think what makes it so refreshing to watch is John Stossel's impeccable ability to play devil's advocate as a journalist, soliciting from Jordan many ideas that had remained hidden before. There's many different tangents to this conversation I need to show you, but watch this before we get into it. Yeah, it's popular with young men because you're saying, yeah, go ahead, abuse women. <laughs> no, I've never said anything like that, and I think that that's... that's it's okay to absolutely. hate trans people. No, it's not okay particularly to hate anyone, maybe even your enemies. And, and my, what I've talked about has virtually nothing to do in any real technical sense with trans people. The stance I took on Bill C-16 was an anti-compelled speech stance, and I, I stand by, by it. Government. Absolutely. There has never been a piece of legislation in the history of the English common law that compelled private speech. Not once. There has been legislation that compelled commercial speech. So, for example, if you sell tobacco, you have to put a warning on the product. But that's commercial speech. It's very, very limited. And even that's been extraordinarily limited. The Supreme Court in the U.S. in the 1940s came out and stated forthrightly that there was to be no compelled speech uh, generated by the, legis by the legislative and the executive branches, that that was unconstitutional. And it violates English common law tradition. And the fact that it has to do with transgender people is virtually irrelevant. The issue is compelled speech. And if it wasn't the issue, this would have died away. All the scandals surrounding this would have died away 18 months ago. It's not what it's about. It's about the government and the ideologues that are pushing this sort of legislation, attempting to uh, exercise uh, tyrannical control over voluntary speech. And that's a no-go zone as far as I'm concerned. So somebody wants to be called Z or Zer. Why not? I don't care what people want to be called. That's fine. But that doesn't mean I should be compelled by law to call them that. The government has absolutely no business whatsoever, ever, governing the content of your voluntary speech. Like, I don't even like hate speech laws. I think they're a big mistake. And that says what you can't say, right? This is what you have to say. That's a whole different, that's a whole different So you were game. personally willing to accommodate people if they want to be called something odd? We could have a conversation about that. And if I was convinced that you knew why you were asking that was actually in your best interest, that, and you weren't just attempting to exercise ideological control over me for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with you personally, then I might consider it in my private conversation, just like I would if you asked me to use a nickname, for example. So, but there's a big difference between privately negotiated modes of address and legislatively demanded compelled speech. It really has nothing to do with transgender people or except peripherally the transgender issue. It's complicated because the legislation that I objected to also writes a social constructionist view of human identity into the law. Social constructionist? Nobody knows what that means. It means it's, it's the theory that underlies the proclamation that gender identity is only a social construct, is only something you learn. It's only a performance that it has no grounding in biology. That's wrong. Now it's written into our law. I think it's clear enough that Jordan's opposition to Canada's compelled speech legislation had very little to do with any supposed transphobia, but there's actually an angle that a lot of people don't see. You'll often hear people say that Canada not having something as robust as the First Amendment led to a bill like C-16 passing, but they're missing a vital part of the picture. If you actually read the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it arguably contains even more protection against compelled speech by just how broadly it defines free speech. It clearly states that, quote, everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, freedom of conscience and religion, and freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. So you might be asking how come Bill C-16, which compelled speech on the transgender pronoun debate, passed in the first place? The answer is that in the first section of that exact charter I just read from, it contains its own fatal flaw by saying this, and I quote, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrated justified in a free and democratic society. In other words, by using the phrase reasonable limits, it ultimately leaves open the question of interpretation to subjectivity of the time. And in a Canadian political scene that's already taken over by a kind of resentful self-victimizing mindset, it's a lot easier to convince the courts that compelling speech for the supposed greater good falls within the purview of the Constitution. 
Jordan Peterson had been virtually screaming about this back then, but evidently to no avail. Why is it wrong? Lots of people believe this. If it weren't for our sexist society, we'd be much more alike. That's actually not the case. The science on that is absolutely clear. So as societies become more egalitarian, and this is mainstream science, by the way, this isn't pseudoscience, this is mainstream science, and, it's, and it was discovered by people who are basically liberal or left-leaning, so it went against the grain, which is part of the reason why it's actually reliable. As societies become more egalitarian, the differences between men and women increase rather than decreasing, and that happens for personality, it happens for spontaneous interest, like the, the, the domain of your interest, which is basically people versus things. And it happens for the probability that women will enroll in STEM fields. So the more egalitarian the society, the lower the probability that women will enroll in STEM fields. And that runs contrary to, well, contrary to the desires of the researchers who generated the data, because no one wanted that. It came as a shock to everyone, but that's how it is. That's what they found. And, and those papers have been cited, they've studied tens of thousands of people in dozens of countries, and the papers have been cited thousands of times. And yet when you say this, it infuriates some people. It should infuriate them, because I'm going right after the heart of the radical leftist doctrine. So it's no wonder they're infuriated. The radical leftist doctrine, which is? Well, partly it is that human identity is purely learned. And the reason that radical leftists believe that is because they believe that if there's no central human nature, then human beings can tr be transformed sociologically, politically, in, into the image that the radical leftists would prefer. Which would be? Oh, God only knows, you know, the new man or some bloody thing like that. The sort of thing that the, the communists were touting back in the 1920s. The re reshaping of society on an egalitarian basis with equality of outcome for everyone. All these unbelievably pathological and, and, and divisive and deadly ideas. And so for challenging this, they call you a transphobic piece of shit. Yeah, that's one of the, they've called me lots of things. Hitler, that was one. I was either Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos, and that was one of the, so, which is quite the insult, eh? You're either Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos. The bloody leftists, they can't even get their insults straight. It should be as discreditable to say that you're a Marxist as it is to say that you're a Nazi, given what we know about the absolutely deadly consequences of the implementation of Marxist doctrine. This is a real issue, eh, is that like, we know the left can go too far. Everyone knows that. And there's a reason for there to be a left wing. The, the left speaks for people who are dispossessed. They're speaking up for the weak. Yeah. Men run most of society. They're defending women. Trans people are often horribly punished, discriminated against. Yeah, well, there's... So you're a bully. There's no doubt that you need someone to speak up for the dispossessed, but that doesn't mean you get to play identity politics. And identity politics just invites a division into tribalism on the right and the left. Because the right plays identity politics too. You know, I would say more in reaction, but it's not a good game. It's not a game that anyone will ever win. It's a game you play if you want everyone to lose. On that, it's actually better to consider the root text of that study and consider how that falls into what Jordan Peterson just said. The research put out by Leeds Beckett University calls it the gender equality paradox in STEM education. And on page 10 of the document, you see one of the most important visualizations that make this point clear. The better a country scores in its global gender equality index, the fewer women it has in STEM fields, which if you don't know, just stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You see countries in Algeria, Tunisia, and Vietnam with some of the highest percentages of women in STEM and nearly 45%. And you see more egalitarian countries like the Nordic states, including Finland, Norway, and Sweden having the least. Can anyone really argue that Algeria or Vietnam is a freer place for women to choose their occupations than Norway and Sweden? Clearly not, and yet this research which strikes at the knee of many of our modern ideas around gender is very rarely even brought up. When women at large don't choose what supposedly they should, according to the dictates of the ideology, it's much less convenient to make sure that ideology remains standing. Identity politics is a little vague for people. What's the harm? It's saying They're saying, shut up. You men dominate everything anyway. And you're just making it worse, worse for weak people. First of all, I think the idea that like men tyrannically dominated everything is a pretty damn weak argument. It's like you look around, I mean, I'm always amazed coming to a place like New York City. And New York's an absolute miracle. It's impossible, this place, right? I mean, how many people come here a day? Seven million? 
It's fundamentally peaceful. Everything works, right? It's rich beyond belief. Everyone is doing better here than anybody has ever done on the, on the face of the planet throughout recorded history. And the whole West is like that. And to call that all a per tyrannical patriarchy is indicative of a very deep resentment and a historical ignorance that's so profound that it's indistinguishable from willful blindness. So look, every society has its tyrannical aspect and nothing is perfect, but we do not so bad in the West. From 2000, the year 2000 to the year 2012, the rate of absolute poverty in the world fell by 50%. It's like, that's pretty good for a patriarchal tyranny. That was the fastest economic development in the history of the world. The great scholars of the totalitarian systems of the 20th century, whether they were on the right or the left, point very, very directly to a relationship between the individual's willingness to subvert their own speech and to speak known lies and the totalitarian excesses of the state. Those two things are directly related causally. There has to be an overarching conceptual framework that we all agree on or we can't exist peacefully. So if you don't want us to exist peacefully, then you can demolish the overarching framework and let everyone revert to their own personal truth. But all that means is chaos. You can't even run a household that way. Not if I'm speaking my truth. Well, you try that with your wife and see how far that goes. The university disciplines that are particularly politically correct, like women's studies, are completely homogenous in their internal viewpoint. They've never heard these facts. First of all, they don't regard them as facts because, well, they don't regard science as an independent and valid discipline, let's say. They regard it as an extension of the oppressive patriarchy. And they're not all that interested in facts. They're interested in ideological completeness, let's say, and have a very, uh, shaky grasp on, on history, especially the history of the 20th century. You know, there, there are reasons for, for the leftist utopian vision. Inequality is a painful reality, right? And every system that we know generates inequality. It's a real problem, at least the capitalist free market so system. So what's wrong with them saying we have to fight this? Because there's no evidence that you reduce inequality by doing that. It doesn't help. Like, we don't know how to reduce inequality. And laying inequality at the feet of the, cap of the capitalist world or at the feet of Western society is, is ignorant, almost beyond comprehension. Inequality is a way worse problem than that. And that's what gives rise to a glaring lack of understanding about human civilization. When you're ascending or reaching for something bigger and better, you're going to have inequality in how fast everyone can reach that ideal. And in this case, it certainly is a balancing act because think about it. If you're looking to equalize a society and have made that your most important goal, is it easier to make everyone lagging behind catch up to the fastest members or simply cut down the fastest ones to the average medium? Time and time again, we've seen the letter option exercised in left-wing utopias gone wrong in history. People went from being unequal in their flourishing to equal with their misery. We would be making a terrible mistake if we attempted to do that again, especially considering how powerful and populous we've become since the Second World War. And still, that's a common thread you see in young people and students who seem to think they've put their finger on the right problems and have the competence to fix them. These are young people. We're, they're so sure of themselves. Where do they get this? Oh, well, you can lay that primarily at the feet of the universities. As far as I'm concerned, the humanities and, and the social sciences, the humanities in particular, disciplines like women's and ethnic studies, which are corrupt right to the core and have been ever since their inception. They're ideologically motivated by their own admission. They're out to produce radical leftist activists by their own admission. All you have to do is go to the websites of these disciplines and look at how they advertise for new recruits. They feed students who are confused and often cynical, prematurely and bitter, uh, an absolutely toxic ideological brew that's predicated on the idea that um, compassion trumps everything as a moral virtue and that society is essentially tyrannical. It's like society is tyrannical, but it's not essentially tyrannical. And compassion isn't the only virtue. And we don't know how to deal with inequality in any case. And the Marxist doctrine, despite its surface attractiveness, is clearly murderous. We've got 100 million corpses stacked up to demonstrate Murderous that. Murderous then, but they say those Stalin is a bad individual. Doesn't mean that. Yeah, so was Mao, so was Pol Pot. The thing is, is it was tried everywhere under all sorts of different conditions by all sorts of different people with all sorts of different rationales. And the end consequence was always the same. Look at Venezuela. Do you know it is now illegal in Venezuela to list starvation as the cause of death in a hospital? 
That's how the Venezuelan government is dealing with food shortages, right? They've made it illegal to diagnose starvation as the cause of death. It's like that pretty much sums up the Marxist doctrine. So if people, I've heard this all many, many times, that wasn't real communism. You know what that means? That means that if I would have been the benevolent dictator in, in the place of Stalin, then I would have brought in the utopia. There isn't a more narcissistic and toxic and inexcusable statement that you can possibly make. What's most important to remember about many of these social moves to the left is that it's very easy for the foot to slip on the slope to more collectivist ideologies. It's in the collectivist political model that antagonism between groups breaks them even further until you've got just the right amount of friction for conflict to start. That's what we saw in Soviet Russia, and we see the glimmers of that in modern America. And it's exactly why it's so important for people to remain vigilant against even the slightest attempts to abandon our individualist tradition for some vision of this collectivist utopia that has been tried and failed before. And what does communism have to do with you calling somebody by the name they want to be called? Well, what's paramount? Is it your group identity or you as an individual? And the collectivist claim is that the proper the mode of analysis is, is better. So we're all in this together. People like that. Yeah, the, the collectivist idea is that the, the canonical element of your identity is your group, whatever that is. Now, that's a problem because everyone fits into multiple groups, which is why intersectionality arose, right? Because that was the left's discovery of their own Achilles heel. But the fundamental claim is that, yeah, people are best conceptualized as part of their group identity and that you are obliged to respect that identity um, no matter what. And that drives, in part, these legislative moves that make address that takes into account group identity of paramount importance. So it's a tenuous connection, but it, the, thread still, the, the thread still exists. It's connected, at least in part, through the doctrine of radical egalitarianism. Right? The idea that equality out, outcome is the, is, the, is the goal to be desired, even hypothetically which, of course, is it's wrong hypothetically and wrong practically for a variety of reasons. I mean, the first is you don't want to equalize across all possible dimensions of comparison because that would make everyone exactly the same in every possible way. And you can't imagine a situation that would be less <clears throat> commensurate with freedom and diversity, let's say, which is another of the left shibboleths than a society where everyone was compelled to be equal in every possible way. But people like that idea. We're all equal. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's truth to it in a sense. Like we're all equal before God, we're all equal before the law. But that's where it stops. And then we're as different as we can be after that. And then we actually want to be because you don't want to pursue the same things that I want to pursue. You don't want to succeed in the same way that I want to succeed. And you might say, well, we don't want there to be success because there has to be failure. You know, and that's a problem. That's the inequality problem. But is that really the case? is you want to eradicate success as part of the price you pay for eradicating failure? No one lives that way. People might say that's what they want, but no one lives that way because if you eradicate success, then you have no impetus for action. What are you doing? You acting so that you'll fail? Is that, is that your motivation? Well, if you want to be motivated, which means if you want to have a purpose in life, like a purpose to set us against the suffering, then you have to be aiming at something where success is a possibility. And that opens up the landscape of success and failure. And there's pain associated with that. But that doesn't mean we eradicate the hierarchy of value itself and leave no one with anything to do. It's, it's a terrible doctrine in every way. And it's mostly motivated by resentment. It's a doctrine that puts a low ceiling on what every member of society can achieve or produce, not allowing members to reach up and grab every star they want while benefiting other people in the process. People's incentive and impetus is taken away from them, making every desire to level up seen as a desire to oppress by being unequal. A person with an ingenious innovation idea has no real reason to work toward realizing it since he's really just a vessel for the state and so is his labor. A world like this strips away from people their desire to improve, become wealthy, produce more, and benefit society from their talent and labor. And in doing that, it takes away a large part of their meaning in life. I think Jordan puts his finger on things so well that it's impossible not to be moved by it. And arguably, he presents the egalitarian case better than even its own proponents can do before striking it down with the weight of experience, knowledge, and historical perspective. That's what has catapulted him as a vital voice on the issue, and that's what made this conversation with John Stossel such a great watch.